This is the section on vulnerability for the lectures on the Vanguard approach to capacity and vulnerability. We're starting at the slide that says vulnerability redefined. Within the Vanguard lectures and within the Vanguard materials, the idea of vulnerability is very much on the basis that vulnerability is a social construct. So one person isn't inherently vulnerable, but they are made vulnerable or less vulnerable due to their conditions. It's not static. And you can see this on the north-south axis, more vulnerable and less vulnerable. For instance, if I was on a street that I know, surrounded by neighbors, I am in the middle of the day, and I'm feeling very confident, and I have people around me, I may feel not vulnerable. Indeed, I may be very, very safe. By contrast, if I was in a strange city, in a difficult or bad part of town, with no money, without friends, and was lost, and there may be people behind me that I'm feeling very threatened by, I am more vulnerable. I am the same person, only my social condition has changed. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So the next slide talks about vulnerability and capacity as not correlative. So because you are more vulnerable does not mean you are less capable. They are separate indices. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So vulnerability and capacity are not determinative of each other. A person can be quite incapable without being particularly vulnerable, or they can be very capable, but highly vulnerable. And let's talk a little bit about some descriptions. This is the section that starts, now what? We're going to look at some case studies and refer to the report. Let's look at the Mary story right now. Mary is 75 years old. She has multiple sclerosis, but she has no cognitive impairments. But she's had a lifetime of abuse and neglect due to her domestic situation. Her husband has been terribly abusive. And when you see the expression gaslighting, it, that's to refer to a situation where somebody is made to feel like they're crazy. Uh, and so they purposely try to make a person feel, I use the term pejoratively crazy, that they are not capable. So it's actually a form of abuse. She's been sexually abused and physically abused, emotionally abused, and the son who grew up in that environment is also an abuser. So she has very little control. She doesn't drive. She has a high degree of social isolation. She is highly vulnerable, but highly capable mentally. Let's look at another example by contrast. Let's look at Indira's story. Indira is 80 years old. She lives in an urban setting. And she's in a residential care home. She is quite incapable. She has friends and family. They try to visit as much as they can. And even though she's not able to necessarily communicate all of her values, wishes, and beliefs, she is able to sort of indicate things that she likes and she doesn't like. And her substitute decision maker tries to take that very strongly into account, as they should. She has comfortable assets, she's got a good savings, and there's a trust set up for her, and so that financial situation is quite secure for her. She has quite low capability, mental capacity, but she also has low vulnerability. She's safe and she's doing well. Let's look at it in another way. Mary we see as more vulnerable, and Indira we see as less vulnerable. Mary is more capable, Indira is less capable. So they're in the different quadrants. The last slide talks a little bit about the intersection of context, culture, continuity, and capacity. And this was uh, a framework created by Peter Levesque, who specializes in knowledge mobilization. And Peter talks about the importance for us to be informed by all of those four C's. So when we're looking at Mary and we're looking at Indira, or indeed looking at our clients or our families and ourselves, we must make sure that when we're looking at how capable or vulnerable a person is, we take into account culture, context, continuity, and capacity. And within the context we've talked about, how are they living? Who is near them? Is there any kind of undue influence that's happening? But culture plays an important role. And so sometimes we might construe or misconstrue 
vulnerability or capacity for cultural difference. So making sure that we understand the role that culture plays. Continuity is really important. When we think about that, what is our intersection in the lives of that person? Is it a one-off kind of capacity assessment? Are they clients that we're seeing for the first time? Are they long-term clients that we're going to be providing care and treatment to? Are they someone that we're going to be volunteering with over an extended period of time? How long is our relationship with them and what do we know? And we're looking at the capacity. It's important, I think, we look at the capacity not just of them, but our own capacity to understand and appreciate what's happening in the lives of other people. In conclusion, this little lecture series has looked at the Vanguard approach. It has looked at an overview of some of the key myths and the aging population. It has brought forward the significant rise in the anticipated number of people with capacity issues in forms of dementia, as well as the intersection of mental health issues. So we know the new normal is an aging population that may have capacity issues. We've heard a little bit about the fact that capacity is the ability to understand and appreciate information, and that's a test across the country. But the capacity is decisional, so we always are asking, capable of doing what? capable of making a will, capable of making a sandwich, these are not the same things. We have to make sure that at each time we're clear about what is it that we're asking when we ask, is the person capable? We've learned that vulnerability is not in this way understood to be inherent to the individual and that all older adults are not vulnerable, but that vulnerability is a social condition and that we can become more or less vulnerable. And we also know that in the end, when it comes down to it, we must never make assumptions, but look at the context the person is in, their culture, what role we play in their lives, and their capacity and our capacity to make decisions. Thank you.